Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. Job is right before the book of Psalms. And if you go there to chapter 5, we are going to read verses 6 through 11 for our scripture reading this morning. Verses 6 through 11 of Job chapter 5. We'll begin together on verse 6, and then I'll read verse 7. We'll alternate like that. And we'll end on verse 11. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word together. <clears throat> and let's begin together on verse 6. Ready? Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground. Yet man is born unto trouble, as the sparks fly upward. I would seek unto God... And unto God would I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields. Let's read 11 together also. To set up on high those that be low, that those which mourn may be exalted to safety. And let's pray together, shall we? <clears throat> Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your words for us so we hold copies in our hand today. Lord, you have promised that 
Your word, when it goes forth, would always accomplish what you purpose it to accomplish. And I pray it would be so this morning. Now, Lord, I pray your blessing on the special as it's brought. May it tune our hearts to your heart today, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each one of us this morning. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly, such as I, to suffer shame and such disgrace, on Mount Calvary take my place. It's then I ask myself this question, who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will, thine for the answer i may never know why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go for who am i when i'm reminded of his words i'll leave thee never trust in me i'll give to you a life forever i wonder what i could have done to deserve god's only son to fight my battles till they're won for who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will thine for? The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go for who am I? The answer I may never know why he'd ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross He'd go for who am I? Hey, that's good. Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, I'm asking for your help as I bring the message today and for the help of the people as they listen this morning. Lord, I pray you'd help us to focus our minds on the word of God and Lord, we each, with the best we know how, would yield ourselves to you and ask you to speak to our hearts this morning. This is the only Sunday morning message on November the 26th, 2017, that we're going to hear. And so, Lord, we want you to help us. We want you to minister to us. We would like you to, as the great potter and we're the clay, put us on the potter's wheel this morning and mold us and fashion us and shape us into vessels of honor for you and use the word of God and the truth we bring this morning to help us in that endeavor and I'll thank you in advance for what I believe you'll do in each one of our hearts in Jesus name I ask it amen <clears throat> notice with your Bibles open at Job chapter 5 verse number 7 Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. And I'm going to talk to you this morning on that subject, born unto trouble. 
A man went to a psychiatrist and said, I've lost all desire to go on. Life's too hectic, too much pressure. I'm overwhelmed. I can't take it. The psychiatrist looked at him and said, you need about two years of treatment at $400 per week. The man looked at the doc and said, well, that solves your problems. Now, what about mine? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Someone said, if you want to forget all your troubles, if you want to forget all your other troubles, wear tight shoes for a day. How many of you ladies say amen to that? Huh? Yeah. Troubles. Job said, man is born unto trouble. The psalmist, David, wrote <clears throat> that I walk in the midst of troubles. Paul in the New Testament said, I'm troubled on every side. Job said, we're just a few days and full of trouble. Most of us can relate in our life to troubles. We close our radio broadcast every day with be good to everyone because everyone's having a tough time. Troubles. Troubles. There's no one here this morning that can say, I'm sure glad I could testify in my life I've never had any trouble unless maybe you're under six years of age. Maybe that's a trouble-free life. I don't know. With our kids it wasn't. Our one, one child we had, he... And I think until he was about seven, he thought his name was No. But uh, No, No. So maybe, maybe it's not so trouble-free. But, you know, uh, we all like the sea of life to stay calm. We all like the days to be sunshine. But when the sea gets rough and the waves get choppy and mean and the clouds of trouble roll in, the thunder and the lightning begins... Trouble is there. And I don't know everybody this morning, but I, I know people enough to know this, that I'm talking to people today that are having marriage trouble. I'm talking to people this morning that are having financial trouble. I'm talking to people having physical trouble. I'm talking to people this morning that have relationship trouble. I may be talking to the people that have employment trouble. But people have troubles. People have trials they're going through. You are a few days and full of trouble. And I want to give you some, just some principles this morning that, that may help you view trouble a little differently than what you view it right now. And, and let me give you the first one this morning is this. Number one, God uses trouble to produce greatness. God uses trouble to produce greatness. Billionaire W. Clement Stone, during the 1929 Wall Street crash, got down on his knees, thanked God he was alive, and that he still had his family. And then he said, and then I moved on. Troubles. Henry Ford said, problems only exist for solutions. Cervantes wrote Don Quixote while he was in jail, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress while he was in jail. When Thomas Edison invented the phonograph, he was almost completely deaf. It used to amuse him that other people had to shout to talk to him. You know what he said? A man that has to, the man that has to shout can never tell a lie. <laughs> you know, you go through the Bible. Abraham had troubles. I mean, think about trouble with Lot, trouble with Hagar, trouble with Ishmael. But he was called the friend of God. Jacob had trouble. In fact, his name is supplanter, trickster, deceiver. But, but he would be renamed Israel because as a prince, he had power with God. Moses had his troubles, lost his temper, murdered an Egyptian got angry and smote the rock. But you know, God took Moses and gave Moses a private burial He never gave anybody else. 
You keep going through the Bible and you can read about Elijah or David or Job or Jeremiah or Daniel or Peter or Paul. And by the way, those are all names that, that you would know and they're familiar to us because if we said, name me some of the great people of the Bible, you would name these people. But I would say to you that God used trouble to fashion them into great people. How many of you ever are familiar with the name Lee Robertson? Anybody? Several of you are in here. Lee Robertson was a pastor for years. He's in heaven now. But for years he was pastor in the uh, 60s, 70s, early, into the early 80s. For 40 years he was pastor at uh, Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Understand this. For, for 40 consecutive years he baptized, their church he baptized, a thousand, at least a thousand people every year for 40 consecutive years. That's just unbelievable to me. That's amazing. A tremendously <clears throat> blessed man of God. Wrote many books and has many sermons in circulation. But when he was young, starting out in the ministry, he was away preaching in a meeting when he got a phone call to come home immediately that his two-year-old daughter had passed away. No explanations. She'd been healthy. They had no, no, no reason as to why. She simply quit breathing. But he and his wife trusted God through the trouble. In fact, after the funeral service, he returned back to the meeting where he was preaching and finished the meeting. In those days, which would have been in the 1950s, um, <clears throat> you didn't have three-day revival meetings. You had three-week revival meetings. And uh, the evangelist came to town and he'd stay for three weeks a month. Oftentimes, an evangelist would go to an area and where there was no church. And sometimes they'd stay for three weeks, four weeks, six weeks. And at the end of that time, the believers who'd been saved and baptized would form a church. And they'd leave with a church there when before there wasn't any church. And so he went back and finished the meeting, but then when he came back to Chattanooga, he and his wife bought some land and they started a church camp. And they called that camp Camp Joy after their daughter. And through the years, they never charged anyone to go to camp there. Anybody could come there free of charge. And, and before he died, there had been 15,000 boys and girls that had come, heard about Jesus Christ, and received Him as their Savior before Lee Robertson had went to heaven. You see, God used trouble to fashion something great. You know, many of the songs you sing in your hymnal were born out of trouble, fashioned out of trouble. You know, if there was no trouble you wouldn't have, it is well with my soul. That was as a result of a man losing his children. Without trouble, there'd be no one ever cared for me like Jesus. That was a result of Charles Weigel, a young evangelist, and his wife leaving him. Wanting nothing to do with Christ, nothing to do with the ministry, nothing to do with God. Without trouble, there'd be no I surrender all. Without trouble, there'd be no Jesus keep me near the cross. Without trouble, there'd be no <clears throat> rescue the perishing or, or face to face with Christ my Savior or all the way my Savior leads me. You see, Fanny Crosby, had she not been blinded at six months of age by the mistake of a doctor, by her own confession, she said, I may have never written those hymns. So she would thank God that she was blinded. In fact, she thanked God that she was blinded, not only so she could write these hymns, but she said, the first face I'll ever see will be the face of my Savior when I see Him face to face. Trouble is simply the window through which we get to watch greatness. Trouble. Let me give you statement number two. Trouble magnifies God's power. Look at Psalm 50, would you please? Psalm 50. You're in Job, just go to the book of Psalms right after the book of Job. And look with me at Psalm chapter 50, the 50th Psalm. 
<clears throat> Notice what Psalm 50 and verse 15 says. <clears throat> and call upon me in the day of, what church? Trouble. And I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Trouble gives us an opportunity to magnify God's power. That's why God allows troubles to come. What do you think God was doing? We, we all like to talk about how David went out with that sling and, and five smooth stones and he took down the mighty Goliath. But listen, who was behind all that? That was God who orchestrated that. That was God who raised up Goliath and said, you come against Israel and I'm gonna, I'm, I've am gonna. got somebody named David who's going to trust me. Remember David said, you come in the name of your gods, but I come in the name of the Lord my God. And, uh, and, and he's going to bring you down. It was an opportunity for God to show his power in the trouble. Troubles always are an opportunity for God to magnify his power. That's the way it was with Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel didn't go in the lion's den as some you know, uh, young 20, 30-year-old guy ready to, you know, I can wrestle a lion if I need to. Remember, David killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. These guys were... These were, these were pretty tough guys, okay? And, uh, but it wasn't Daniel. Daniel was in the lion's den somewhere in his 80s or maybe early 90s. Okay? You, 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 you're different when you're an 80-year-old man down there. There's no way you're going to fight off a lion. What was that all about? That was an opportunity for God to show His power. Anytime there's trouble that comes up, it's an opportunity for God to show up. It's an opportunity for God to show His power. Don't miss out on that. How often, <clears throat> as soon as there's a Goliath or as soon as there's a lion's den, we say, God, get me out of this. God, take this away. God, I don't want this trouble. Instead of saying, God, here's an opportunity for you to show your power in my life. What an opportunity. The Hebrew children in the fiery furnace and God delivering them and Moses and the Israelites at the Red Sea and God parting the waters. You go all the way through the Bible and you see that troubles came and it was an opportunity for God to show His power. Remember so often when, when Brother Jarvis and his testimonies of, of things in Mexico and the storms coming in or the provision needs to be made, you know what it is? He, he, he always stops and says, well, this is a great time to see what God's going to do. This is an opportunity to see what God's going to do. When you have the bills that come due, when you have a sickness that comes upon your life, or you have a marriage that's, that's struggling, or you have a wayward child that's away from God, then, then you say, man, you have a difficulty at your job or difficulty in your family, and you say, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. I just feel like it's too much for me to handle. Listen, then look to God, because it's an opportunity for Him to show His power. What an opportunity. God still has power. It's not your power that will get you through. It will be His power that will get you through. The songwriter wrote, Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Listen, if, you had never, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. You see? You'd, you'd never know if it weren't for trouble. So trouble's an opportunity to magnify His power. Trouble produces greatness. Number three, look at Psalm 46. Would you turn there with me, please? Psalm 46, and notice with me verse number one. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help when? In trouble. God's a very present help in trouble. Run to God in the trouble. Number three, run to God in your trouble. So often in trouble, you know what people do? They don't run to God. They run away from God. They don't run to the things of the Lord. They run away from the things of God. Running away from the very person who could help them. That's God. You remember when Hezekiah got a threatening letter. And he took that letter and everybody was afraid of the impending attack. And Hezekiah, the Bible says, went to the temple and spread that letter out before God. And got on his face. And he, and he took it to the Lord. 
He's a very present help in time of trouble. What trouble should you take to God and lay it out before Him and say, Lord, I need your help. Run to your prayer closet. Run to where you meet with God. Run to where you can give it to the Lord. Run to the house of God. Run to the people of God. Run to the Word of God. Don't let trouble cause you to run away from who you ought to run to. Run to God. Sometimes that's, that's the last thing sometimes that, that you want to do that your flesh wants to do. Sometimes we get so troubled and we're so overwhelmed and we feel so, uh, so buried under that and when you say, hey, get your Bible and read it. You know what your flesh says? I don't want to read it. I don't want to take the Bible. I don't want to go to church. I can't face anybody. I can't go in there and look at everybody. But that's exactly what you need. It's exactly what the Lord would have you to do. Don't let trouble stop you. Don't let trouble sidetrack you. It may knock you down, but it doesn't have to knock you out. It may knock you down, but it doesn't have to knock you out. Go to God. Troubles produce greatness. Troubles magnify God's power. Run to God in your trouble. Number four. Look in the New Testament with me, will you please? It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 3. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God, <clears throat> even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The fourth thing I want to leave with you this morning is this God makes special people for special troubles. Here it says, God gives us troubles, tribulation is trouble, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. By the same comfort that we've been comforted of God. So we go through the trouble, so God comforts us, but we, are, we experience that so we can help someone else when they go through the trouble. God knows what trouble He's going to give us. When Job says, man's days are few and full of trouble, who was it that allowed Satan to bring trouble into Job's life? It was God. God allowed that to happen. God, hey, who set the limits on what Satan could do with Job? God did. Who do you think sets the limits on what can happen in your life and my life? God does. God sets those limits. God knew Abraham would depend on him. God knew Jacob would depend on him. God knew Elijah would depend on him. God knew Daniel would depend on him. God knew the three Hebrew children would depend on him. God knew Paul would depend on him. God knew Lee Robertson would depend on him. God knew that Charles Spafford, who wrote It Is Well With My Soul, would depend on him. God knew Charles Weigel, who wrote No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus, would depend on him. God knew that Fanny Crosby would depend on him. You look around sometimes at people in the church and you think, well, there's a, there's, there's a great Christian. Or there's a, there's a good example of a believer. But you don't know what trouble God used in their life to bring them to where they are now. You can look at Brother Wallace and, and, and respect him and admire him as his love for God and his faithfulness to the Lord. But he's been married to Kay for 25 years. No, I'm kidding. That's uh, And I'm kidding. Brother Bob went through a time, was it a detached retina that he had? And you were out of work for over a year. For close to a year. A year, no income. A year, unable to work. Think about that. How would you live? How would you survive a year if you had no job and no income? You see, you don't, you don't look at 
It, you look at him now and say, man, look at, look at what look, look at what type of man he is and look at the kind of man he is. Look what God has done. Yeah, but you didn't see the trouble God used to fashion him and to make him into the man he is now. You see, God, God has certain troubles for certain people. And now he's able to comfort others and encourage others who go through trials. Don't you think you can go to, don't you think if you're without work and you're trying to figure out what to do and how to trust God, don't you think there's somebody like Bob Wallace you could talk to? He's, he's been through that, so the same comfort that he was comforted, he can comfort you. You look at someone like Mrs. Taylor, and look at her as an example of a godly lady. And one that you could learn from and one that you could emulate. But you understand, God, you have to know what God used to fashion that lady. And to make that greatness into her. She had a, she had a husband that walked out on her. Left her with three children. And she continued faithful to God. She continued to serve the Lord and continued to, to do. You, you think about, talk about toughness. Difficult, difficult times. Trouble. But you see, you just look at what you see now with Mrs. Taylor. But you don't get to see, you don't know. Some people who've known her through that time, they know what God used. They know how God fashioned her. But I tell you what, she's, while, while no one, listen, while no one would say, <clears throat> listen, J Charles Spafford would not say, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful my children died. Nobody would say that I'm glad that that happened, but they would look back and say, without that trouble in my life, I wouldn't be who I am now. I wouldn't be the Christian I am now. We talked about it the other night, how Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. We all like to know Him in the power of His resurrection. Oh, I want that power in my life. Oh, I want to see God do great things in me and through me. But do you want to be part of the fellowship of His suffering? Nobody volunteers for that. Lord, let me suffer so I can have a fellowship with You that very few have. But that's how you get a Fanny Crosby. That's how you get a Charles Weigel. That's how you get a Bob Wallace. That's how you get a Mrs. Taylor. And there's others in this room who've been through similar situations. And you look back and say, that wasn't pleasant. But God used it to make me what I am today. Who I am today. With the Apostle Paul, you say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. God brings special trials to special people whom He desires to use in a special way. You know, fruit trees are not found on the mountaintops. Fruit trees are found in the valleys. You know, gold is one of the most valuable materials on earth. It's been used for centuries, of course, as money, but it has many other uses in industry, manufacturing, and even in space. One of the traits that makes gold so useful is that it can be shaped and formed so easily. In fact, a single ounce of gold can be flattened out to cover 300 square feet. A single ounce of gold can be flattened out and cover 300 square feet. But you know when gold is dug out of the ground, it contains many other elements that have to be removed before the gold can be useful. That refining process for gold, as most of you know, involves intense heat. Gold melts at a temperature of about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That incredible temperature is required for gold to be used. The Christian life involves much the same process. 
Sometimes we're surprised when we, in our eyes, bad things happen to good people. But the truth is, trials are part of God's refining process for our life. God is refining us. What He's doing is He turns on the heat of the trouble or the heat of the trials and it, it purifies, it gets the impurities out that we don't need to have in our life. Rather than, than complaining when the trials come, we should rejoice when the trials come. Because God is refining us. God is working out the impurities. Why? Because He wants to use us. He wants us to be usable for Him. And He can't do that until He gets the impurities out. That's why James would say, hey, count it all joy when you come into diverse temptations. When you have different trials in your life, count it joy. Because God's getting ready to use you. No wonder Job said, When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Usable for him. Troubles produce greatness. Troubles magnify God's power. In troubles, make sure you run to God, our refuge and strength, to help in time of trouble. And God makes special people for special troubles. Thank God for your troubles. Thank God that that we have troubles. But thank God we have a God to go to in the trouble. And we can understand what He's doing in our life. Now the truth is, I was in serious trouble one time, and, and you are in serious trouble with God as well because we've all sinned in His sight. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all in trouble with God because we're guilty before Him. There is none righteous, no, not one. So there's none of us that can come before God and say, I'm good enough for you to let me into heaven. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That death is separation. That's what death, the word death means. Separation. That's why it's hard for us when we lose a loved one or someone we care about. It hurts so bad because we're separated from them. We'll never see them. God says the wages of sin is death, separation from Him. And the place you're separated from God is in a place called hell. And hell is real. It's as real as heaven is. It's as real as this building is right here where we are. Hell was not prepared for us. It was prepared for the devil and its angels. But when we sinned against God, that became our penalty, our payment for our sin. We would have to die and be separated from Him in hell. But God loves you. God loves you. God loves me. And He didn't create us to be separated from Him in hell. But God is just, and God says, justice says sin has to be paid for. But God loves us and He wants to show us how much He loves us. And so what God did to satisfy justice and to show us how much He loved us, He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, into the world to live a perfect, sinless life and then die on the cross as a payment for our sins. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It means He died on our behalf. He did it for you and He did it for me. Jesus was the Son of God and being the Son of God, the Bible says He never committed a single sin. That He was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet without sin. Now that's important because had Jesus sinned, He could not pay for your sin or mine. No matter how much you care about somebody, no matter how much you love somebody, you cannot pay for their sin. You know why? You have your own sin that you've got to answer for. So I cannot take care of yours. i got my own. Jesus Christ had none. But He went to the cross on Calvary and He hung there. And He bled and He died. The wages of sin is death. But it wasn't His sins. He didn't have any. Whose sins was Jesus dying for? Our sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, my friend, was laid on Jesus. And he said, God, punish me instead of stay in slave ball. 
God, punish me, instead of Bob Wallace. God, punish me. Put your name in there. He died for you. He took your sins upon himself. He became sin for us when he knew no sin. And when you, by faith, put your trust in Jesus Christ, the perfectness of Jesus just put on your account. And God looks down and he doesn't see you as the sinner who deserves to pay for his sin in hell. He sees you as perfect as his son, Jesus Christ. Somebody say, you've got to be perfect to go to heaven. That's right. But it's not your perfectness. It's the perfectness of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says, the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, what I want to give you is a gift and it's eternal life. Now, when he talked about sin, he talked about wages. Wages you have to earn. Wages you have to, you have to do something for. But gifts are given to you. Gifts are given to you because someone else has paid for it. Well, God says His gift to us is eternal life. Isn't it interesting how many times when people say, well, what can I do to get eternal life? And they start giving you a list of what they have to do. Well, you've got to go to church. You have to get baptized. You have to try to live a good life. You have to try to do good things. And they give you a list of what you've got to do. Well, wait a minute. If it's a gift, how come I'm trying to earn it? You can't. Gifts are already paid for. Well, if God's gift to us is eternal life, who paid for it? Yeah, Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. That's why God said the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not through what we do. It's through what Jesus Christ has already done for us when he died on the cross. That's why God says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I call on Jesus and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin in hell. But I believe you died on the cross, Jesus, and you paid my sin debt for me. By the way, he was buried, rose again the third day. He's alive. And if you'll call upon him and say, I'll trust you and what you've done for me to receive your gift of eternal life and one day take me to heaven, God says you shall be saved. He didn't say you might be saved. He didn't say you could be saved. He didn't say you could hope to be saved. He said you shall be saved. And that's a guarantee, not from me, but from God. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus alone, he'll give you the gift of eternal life, and you shall be saved. And guess what? Your sin trouble is cared for. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And I'm not in trouble with God anymore. Because he now looks at me and sees Jesus Christ. I am in him. When you trust him as your Savior, you're in him. And he sees the righteousness of Jesus when he looks at your life. And if you've never settled the sin issue, settle it today. It is not difficult to receive a gift. It is so simple. I have a, I have a Bible Baptist Church pen in my pocket. David, here's a pen for you. There you go. How hard was that? What did he do? Reach out and took it. You know what you do to receive God's gift of eternal life? You reach out and take Jesus as your Savior. And when you do that, you receive eternal life. And you get a home in heaven one day. Trouble. Trouble. That'll solve the sin trouble. As a child of God, you have troubles. God will use those troubles in your life to fashion you, to make you into the vessel he desires you to be. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer. Thank you for this morning and for everyone's attention today. Lord, we want to thank you for the trials and the troubles you send our way. That troubles will produce greatness in us. Oh, not, not maybe as the world looks at greatness, but certainly as you look at greatness. Lord, that trouble will magnify your power in our life. Lord, that trouble, in trouble, we'd learn to run to you. 
and find comfort in our refuge and our strength. Dear Lord, we remember that you make special troubles for special people. But Lord, as we look at men in the Bible and women of the Bible, they're all people who went through trouble. And we look at people in our congregation, different ones that we could point out that we look up to and we respect and we admire their faith and their walk with God. But Lord, we understand you use trouble in that process to refine us, to make us vessels unto honor for you. And so, Lord, I pray twofold this morning. I pray you'll use the message to encourage believers to thank God for their troubles and allow you to accomplish what you desire in our life through the trouble we're in. And, Lord, I pray that you'll help those this morning who still have sin trouble. That if they're tired of the load of their sin, to let Jesus come into their heart. That if they desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come into their heart and they'll receive the gift of God, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ today. That they'll be willing to call on Jesus and trust Him as their personal Savior. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many this morning would say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew I was in trouble with God. I realized that I was a sinner who needed a Savior. But I knew and I heard that Jesus was the Savior I needed. And Pastor, what you talked about this morning was exactly what I did. I knew Jesus died for me, was buried, rose again, that He took my place, that He was my substitute, and that if I put my faith and trust in Him, I'd receive His gift of eternal life. And Pastor, there's a time in my life when I did that. And I know today, Pastor, if something happened to me, my last breath on earth, my next breath would be in heaven. I know that I'm saved. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that that would be my case. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know if I took my last breath here, where my next breath would be, but I'd like it to be heaven, and I think you would like it to be heaven. You say, Preacher, I'm I'm concerned about it. Would you pray for me? I'll pray for you. I could embarrass you or call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, Pray for me? Thank you. Anybody else this morning join this? Say, pray for me. The message was mainly to believers today. I wonder how many believers today would say, Preacher, I'm going through some trouble. I, I understand what Job was saying. My days are few and full of trouble. But, Preacher, the, 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 the Lord helped me this morning. I've seen some purposes for trouble, I've seen some things I need to do in the midst of trouble. Pastor, God spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, would you respond to Him today? When I'm done praying, the pianist will begin to play. We'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Bob will sing. Others will be coming to pray at the altar. Would you slip out from your seat and just come forward and say, I'd like to receive Christ as my Savior. We have people who have been trained. They'll take the Bible. They'll show you those verses I quoted to you. And you can receive them today. You can walk out the doors in a few minutes knowing your sins are forgiven. Knowing you have eternal life. Nothing like it in all the world. If you're today and you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized, you'll say, well, Pastor, I, I, want, I need to be baptized and I want to be obedient to the Lord and follow Him in baptism. If you're saved and you're baptized, God has spoken to your heart today, Christian. The altar's open for you just to come. Maybe you just need to come and kneel down and thank God for your troubles and ask Him to accomplish in your life what He desires through the troubles. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Lord, I thank you for ministering to each of us through your word today. 
Lord, we talk about troubles and we know that we all have them. No one's exempt. And I pray that we'd always know what to do in the trouble. Lord, that we would never run from you, but we would run toward you. And that we would realize you're a very present help in time of trouble. An opportunity for you to show your power, your greatness. An opportunity for us to be able to comfort others in the future with the trouble we're going through. Use it in people's lives today, Lord. We love you. May each of us now do what you're bidding us to do in our heart. Have your way in every life during this invitation time. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? Soul, are you weary and troubled? That's right. No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, thank you so much for loving us and, Lord, for accepting us as we are, but loving us enough not to leave us as we are. Continue to fashion us, mold us, make us into vessels of honor for you. We desire that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, that we do all for the glory of God. And so, Lord, help us to accept that process that you use in our lives to make us more like Christ, that we could glorify you with our life. <coughs> Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Give us a good Sunday afternoon. Prepare our hearts what you have for us this evening when we come back for the evening service. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.